This is Fort Collins Living History. I'm Linda Lloyd. Our guests today are here to help us explore the historical aspects of agriculture in this part of, of the country. They're here from the um, B Family Centennial Farm Museum. I'd like to introduce Philip B, Liz Harrison B, and Bob B. And I appreciate your coming today. I think that we can explore many aspects of agriculture. Uh, let's begin with uh, your place that from which you have come, the B Family Centennial Farm Museum. Tell us mm -hmm. first what a centennial farm is. Centennial farms, a farm that's been in the same family for a um, hundred years, and it's a designation that's given by the Colorado Historical Society and the Colorado Department of Agriculture. And so we we got that designation in 1994. So your farm yeah. was in your family since a hundred years before 94. Yes, yeah, since well, 1894. Certainly that's exciting. So, and yeah. then um, since it's the B family Centennial Farm, you could perhaps tell us a little bit about the hundred years of the B family at this farm. Well, <laughs> our great great grandparents came to Colorado in 1882 from Iowa and they came on the train. Most people think that the early timers all came on covered wagons. Well, that wasn't always true. The railroad had just come through, and so they came by train. Uh, they originally homesteaded north of Fort Collins. They wanted to buy an irrigated farm, but it was too expensive. And so they went six miles north of Fort Collins and found an area where there was a depression in the ground that collected water in order to run cattle. And so that's where they staked out a homestead of 160 acres and started farming. Uh, and uh, they were there probably until about the 1900s when North Poudre Irrigation Company wanted their homestead site for a reservoir. And uh, they uh, sold the <coughs> homestead site to North Pooter and moved over to uh, uncle's farm. He had passed away and my grandfather had gone over to help his aunt farm the property and then the family moved over and moved a two-story house, uh, put it up on logs and drove it with the team of horses and pulled it over and tied it into their other homestead site and that's where they started farming is where the Centennial Farm is today. So the two families had merged and yes. settled on this mm -hmm. particular spot. Yes. And a hundred years later. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and as I understand it, the mm -hmm. family uh, families had mm -hmm. saved uh, everything yeah. from the uh -huh. um, clothing to tools and machinery and so on. And it's pretty much all still there. And that leads me to my next question. We've, we know why it's the B family, Centennial, Farm Museum. Tell us what that is all about. <laughs> well, after our, our father passed away in uh, 96, we started going through things and kind of realized how much was there <laughs> because the family had saved, like you say, letters and diaries and pictures and lots of artifacts. And so we, we thought it was time to do something with that. And so the idea of uh, starting a farm museum, I guess, began at that point, <laughs> and we've been working on that since then. Many so hours <laughs> and much work. <laughs> yeah, so. But it's a very exciting place to be, and it will help us, everyone, mm -hmm. learn about um, old ways as well as the incoming ways of agriculture, and let's talk about those today. When I think about what it would have been like for your uh, great-grandfather great mm -hmm. to start farming, by the way, did they bring a lot of the equipment with them on the train when they came? I don't think we they don't brought know. any. Well, Goodness, and breaking the land and, and starting, I think, labor yeah. intensive. Uh, so tell us what you know about farming when they first would have arrived. Yeah. Th they may have brought some things with them because they did come by train. Mm -hmm. I know there's a couple of pieces of furniture that have John B's name on them, and, and they came from Iowa. So we're, we're not real sure, but <laughs> they may have brought a few things. I, I think it's a little bit hard for people in our generation to conceive 
of, of what it would have been like to have come to the open prairie to start farming. Um, I think one of the one of the elements that they had to deal with was that without irrigation water, when they first came to this area, they were coming to a desert. And, and the area that we live in in, in northern Colorado um, is basically a desert without the irrigation water. And um, <coughs> the idea of taking a plow and hooking it to a horse and going out and, and breaking uh, probably prairie sod uh, was was the way they started, and um, it, like you said, it was very labor intensive. Um, everything was done with with the horse and and, and by hand. Um, the planting and uh, might have been mechanized, but um, mechanical planters didn't arrive on the scene until the the early 1900s. So. When they uh, initially started, I, I think more of a, like a garden project, something that would help to sustain the family. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, I mean, I think that's the way they approached life in the early days was uh, from a viewpoint of sustainability, just for the family, instead of so much as production agriculture that, that we think about today. Were there other ways then to bring in um, money since they weren't planting so many crops to sell? They were, or were they just sustaining their family? Th they did raise cattle I when see. they first started mm -hmm. and, and also horses. Our great uncle raised horses and um, hired out to build some of the reservoirs and canals in the area. And so I think he made his living that way. I see. And, yeah. there, were, there were products like eggs that could be raised mm -hmm. on the farm mm -hmm. fairly cheaply. Um, they had some milk cows and, and they probably sold milk to neighbors, uh, this sort of thing. So there were, um, I guess, not, not significant income, mm -hmm. but, but in those days it was any, anything would help. And, and I'm sure that they did that in, in the early days. And then as more mechanized methods of farming became available, were more uh, fields planted? I, th I think one of the things that mechanization allowed them to do was to expand. Mm -hmm. And um, one man could, could uh, farm more acres and it, um, it went from being just a, an enterprise of sustaining the family to uh, to production agriculture, where you're producing enough to, to sell as a commodity from the farm. And I'm guessing irrigation had something to do with that as well. <laughs> well, irrigation had a big part in it. <laughs> uh, well, one of the stories that we have in our collection is that when they first came, uh, my great great grandfather first. When he first came from Iowa, he farmed like he had in Iowa. Similar practices and did everything. In the first year, he had a very good crop. And uh, the next three years that he did the very same thing, well, it became dry, no rain, things dried up, and he barely survived. Matter of fact, he had to go work on an irrigated farm in order to survive to get enough income to keep the family going. So, uh, and then when the, uh, my grandfather came over and took over for his great aunt, for our great aunt, uh, one of his first projects was to dig an irrigation well because the supply of water through the irrigation company at that time was so small and so unreliable that he wanted a source of water that was more reliable. So he went and dug a well by hand, 32 feet deep, lined it with cement cinder blocks, and the well is still on the northwest corner of the farm and is, is dry right now, but has been in production since he dug it by hand, so. I really don't have any idea how did they a 32-foot <laughs> hole, how did they get the water out of the hole into the field? Well, he had a pump, mm -hmm. and they had a, a old one-cylinder engine that ran it. 
and pumped water out of that. To, and it was a six inch pipe, the water that came out of the well. So uh, <laughs> it, it supplied the water that he wanted to work with. And when he came and started farming with his aunt, uh, they had 160 acres as part of the homestead. But he probably only farmed about 20 acres of that. The rest of it was grass pasture that they grazed cattle on or horses. And so they didn't farm the whole 160 acres. Matter of fact, it wasn't until the late 30s before they farmed the full 160 acres of the farm. So, uh, and, and that just came from mechan the mechanization of equipment and the capability of them to farm. And so they planted more and more land and yes. in what kind of crops? I think that changed over history too, didn't it? It did. Yeah. Um, our, our father, uh, when he started farming, um, developed a, a dairy cow herd. But prior to that, our grandfather um, had fed a lot of sheep. And in the, in the early 1900s, um, 1904 to 1906, the sugar beet industry came into Larimer County and they discovered that um, one of the byproducts of the sugar beets are the sugar beet tops, the leaves on the beets. And when beets were dug, they were, uh, originally they were all dug by hand. Uh, they had a, well they had a, like a plow that would go in and lift the beets out of the ground. And then people would come along with beet knives and uh, they would physically grab the beet and cut the leaves off. And they soon learned that the, the leaves were, were a valuable source of uh, feed for, for livestock. And so a sheep industry started in, in Larimer County. And at one time, Larimer County was the, the largest sheep feeding uh, area in the United States. And our grandfather used to, to get a band of, of a thousand sheep and would spend his winters um, following this herd of sheep from one beet field to another as they grazed on the beet tops. Um, so sugar beets were, were an important early crop as well as small grains, wheat, um, barley. Um, barley was raised on the farm for several, several years as a source of feed and a, and a source of grain that we would feed to the dairy cows once the dairy operation was started. Um, and then in, in the early, well, late 40s, early 50s, um, pinot beans and more corn came into the area as, as the irrigation system was more fully developed and water was available to irrigate with. Lots of changes over the years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you yeah. talked about the size of the fields when they um, first uh, started raising the sugar beets, they would plant, you know, maybe five or 10 acres and and the last year we farmed, we planted like 100 acres. Mm. And so that just shows the difference between the size of the equipment and how much more was produced <laughs> and later. And by the time you were at 100 acres, I'm thinking probably machinery had been invented to do yes. a whole lot more of the work than yeah. back at 10 acre time. Yes, yes, exactly. Was the family <laughs> able to do all the work um, when sugar beets were first planted? Uh, they I did hire some of the German families from Russia. Um, we have pic some pictures of them to hoe and thin the sugar beets, and I'm sure to help harvest them also. Mm -hmm. yeah. And <coughs> excuse me, I think there's a migrant um, worker uh, home. Um, yes. So you did have mm. some uh, you. <laughs> Your family <laughs> <laughs> had some other folks who came to help, probably at planting and harvesting or throughout the season. Most of the migrant workers that the company brought in to help work with the sugar beets were usually there only for about a two-month period. And they did the, the thinning, the hoeing, and the weeding of the beets. And usually they were gone by the time harvest came around. Oh, I see. Yes. Because machines could do most of that. Most of it, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so in their earlier years, a matter of fact, uh, the schools would let the, would actually let the kids out of school 
in the thinning time period and also the harvest period to help get the sugar beets out of the ground mm -hmm. and harvested. The first so, couple of days, the kids probably thought that was great. That's that was true. Cool. <laughs> and then after they were put to work, two, it two, wasn't as much two, fun. Two, three weeks later, <laughs> let's go back to school. Let's go back to school. Absolutely. <laughs> Yep. Well, um, it's interesting to know about outside. I'm wondering about inside the house. Let's okay. talk about that because I think labor intensive might be an okay word for um, the woman's work, shall we call it, that went on inside the home too. Think about your grandmother or your great-grandmother. What would it take to keep a family fed and clothed and um, dressed to go to school and so on? Yeah. Um, like you say, labor intensive, <laughs> I'm sure. We know all the food was made from basic ingredients. Um, I'm sure there were very little prepared food. Um, it was, you know, early all cooked on the wood stove, so you'd have to build a fire and uh, do that. Um, I'm, I'm sure they had, had a big garden and preserved a lot of the food, food with too. canning and mm -hmm. There was a root cellar that food was stored in through the winter. Um, like we've mentioned, they, they raised their own chickens and so had their own eggs and made their own butter. And um. Be before electricity came to the farm, though, <laughs> they didn't have washing machines or dryers. And so as far mm. as the maintenance of clothing, it was all, mm. all washed by hand. And there are some washboards on the farm and mm. some and some metal tubs that were used to, to wash clothes in. And um, like you said, it was uh, uh, much more labor intensive uh, mm -hmm. for providing for a family as a, as a farm wife than, than it is today. I remember seeing a sewing machine in one of the yeah. houses. And so I, I suspect many mm -hmm. of the clothes were made at home as well. As besides the hard <coughs> work of taking care of them, you had to make them first. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure. And I think yeah. perhaps, I, I'm certain children took much better care of their clothing because <laughs> they had so few. Um, yeah. Again, so much work and an expense yeah. for the family, I'm sure, yeah. as well, to go to town. Speaking yeah. of going to town, <laughs> <laughs> it was what, six miles from Fort Collins out to the farm? From their mm -hmm. original homestead site. From our, where the Centennial mm -hmm. Farm is, it's about 12 miles. 12 miles. Yes. So if you needed <coughs> flour, if you needed a bolt of cloth, if you needed water, I, I found that a fascinating story um, that a lot of the water that was uh, pumped up went to the field and for clean drinking water, that came from town. That came from town. Tell <laughs> about that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the groundwater under the ground on the farm uh, is drinkable, but it's not very good drinkable Nasty. water. <laughs> it's what they call hard water. It was fine for the livestock. It was fine for the crops. And, and probably for some of the domestic use as far as washing clothes and doing mm -hmm. that stuff. But when it came to really good drinking water, they went to town every two weeks and filled up a water tank mm -hmm. on a wagon and brought it back to the farm. And that was a every two week chore way back when they were doing it with horses. That's so a long walk. <laughs> when when that time came, they would go and fill up the supply list of whatever they needed, the sugar, the flour, uh, a bolt of cloth, uh, Whatever, whatever else they would need, they had the list and they would do that when they went for water. Yeah. And one, uh, one of the artifacts that's at the farm is, a, is an old wagon, a horse-drawn wagon that has uh, the original metal container on it that was used to transport water from Port Collins to the farm before a domestic water line was put in in the early 1960s. Oh, so even in the 1940s and 50s, we're going in for water. Oh, yes. yes. So yeah. then you get back to the farm with a tank of water. Does it? Does the water stay in the tank until it's empty? No. They, they, <laughs> they dug what we call is a cistern. Mm -hmm. And they dug a big hole in the ground and lined it with brick and mortar and made a hole at the top of it in order to get the water in. And then they usually had a 
pump of some type to pull it back out of that cistern and, and sometimes not even get it into the house. They just had a pump out there that pumped to fill the bucket and then brought it into the house. But eventually they had an, another pump that did get it into the kitchen part of the house. So. Oh, that, that was the young boy's job. Oh, <laughs> yes. Bucket of water, young man. Water. <laughs> yeah. and, and no restroom facilities in the houses either. Mm -hmm. There was the outhouse, usually a two-holer outhouse in the out on the corner part of the uh, yard area or corral area or someplace, and you walked out and went to the bathroom. A wonderful trip so, at oh 20 yes. degrees below zero, <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, one thing we're able to show at the museum, we do have two rooms of the original homestead house, and so you can see what it's like, you know, when there was just the outhouse without running water, and we also have a home that was built in 1942 and that's the first time they had electricity and, and running water and the facilities inside. So it's interesting to, to see the contrast. To the previous. Yes. 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 Well, it's good for us to see the yeah. steps and to understand how different it was 100 years ago. Yeah. Would you think back to your family stories? All, all families have stories. And I'm thinking about things like um, what did your um, forebears like to do for fun. <laughs> I'm sure there was a little <laughs> time for fun. Um, well, anything. What kind of yeah. stories have you heard about your ancestors? They, they like to go to the mountains. There's pictures of them camp, do, camping yeah. in the mountains. <laughs> but when we were children, you know, we, we milked the dairy cows, so you had to be there morning and night. Uh -huh. But Sunday afternoons, uh, a lot of times we went to the mountains for drives uh, on Sunday afternoons. There are some old so. ice skates that mm -hmm. hang up in one of the buildings and uh, there was a pond on the farm at one time that when it froze over in the winter time I think they would use ice skates and do some ice skating. Okay. Uh, our grandfather, there's a picture of our grandfather as a young man with a bicycle that he owned and uh, so I think he would probably ride that bicycle um, it was probably faster than a horse was mm -hmm. at that point in time. Mm -hmm. But uh, those are a couple of things that come to mind. Mm -hmm. There's even re reference in a letter to ice skating on the Puda River. So that they must have done that at one point. Absolutely. <laughs> Great yeah. fun. Yes. <laughs> our, our grandfather also had um, um, a very nice bookshelf and was mm -hmm. filled with books that uh, uh, I'm... I'm guessing anyway that he probably read most of those books, and I, I think reading was was um, an activity that they they did a lot of, uh, maybe a lot more of in those days, mm -hmm. without the without the distractions of television or or the computer that we have today. And books, I understand, were, were very precious. They were yeah. more expensive mm -hmm. in yes. terms of uh, what families made for income, so they were valuable and mm -hmm. treasured. Mm -hmm. Yes, That's or, wonderful. or, or, or we're given for Christmas gifts a lot. Yes. Some of the books have the dates written in them and who they were to and from, which is real special. Yes, it certainly <laughs> is. Yes. Isn't yeah. there a, a, a sad story about one of your <laughs> um, aunts or grandmothers uh, who uh, were out in a rainstorm? Yes, uh, our great-grandmother was actually killed by lightning on the farm um, in 1905. She was out covering her garden before a storm came up and was killed. And then so it seems to me that the family had more uh, work mm -hmm. to take on uh, besides being saddened by her death. Everyone else had to pick up the pieces of the things that she would have been doing on a daily yes, basis. Yes, yes. And, and actually a, a niece came to the farm at that time and, and ended up marrying our grandfather. <laughs> she, she was our Uncle Al's niece and so that's kind of a fun story also that that's how they met and mm -hmm. she, she, she got to, to the farm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. tell about the turkeys. Somebody has to tell about oh. the turkeys. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so some of the livestock that they had when they were mm. trying to survive yeah. was uh, the chickens and they also raised turkeys. And uh, they probably had a flock of 20 to 40 turkeys mm -hmm. and uh, I would assume that they raised them for meat, and they also raised them to sell. Mm 
It was probably a source of income for him to, to do the turkeys. So, uh, and that was a, another chore that the children and the wife usually did, uh, was take care of the livestock and the chores around the area. My grandmother would almost always go out to milk the cow. Uh, we have a picture of my aunt, which would have been her daughter, helping her go out to milk the cow, but uh, most of the time she wouldn't let her milk the cow because she was afraid the cow would kick her and <laughs> knock the bucket <laughs> over and spill the milk and make a <laughs> mess and the milk was valuable. <laughs> you know, it wasn't something you wanted to waste and let the cow kick over, so she usually <laughs> milked the cow. So. <laughs> so the kittens didn't get any. <laughs> uh, not very often. Well. <laughs> one, one of the uh, other livestock mm -hmm. operations on the farm was, was with the dairy cows. And in the, in the late 1940s, there was a dairy barn that was built on the farm out of uh, brick and mortar. And um, it was about the same time that electricity was brought to the farm. And um, that um, greatly improved the ability to produce milk because of the electricity to run um, milking machines and milking pumps that were used to uh, milk the cows with. But our, I can remember our grandfather talking about the barn when it was first built. And one of the comments he made was that it was the warmest building on the farm. And uh, when they had, as they had electricity, they could put in electric heaters and and, uh, and the barn was tighter and, and better built than any of the previous buildings on the farm. So he's living to wish the house didn't <laughs> have quite as many cracks yeah. in it too. <laughs> the, the original house was a two-story house mm -hmm. and, and uh, I can remember our father mm -hmm. talking about when he was a young boy, he would get up in the mornings and his feet were always cold and, and walking down the cold steps down to a, a a coal burning stove that was in the house where, where the kids would gather to get warm on a, on a cold morning. Yeah. Oh, we're so spoiled now. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> we <laughs> are. My, my, my aunt said that at night when they went to bed, they would, mm. there was cast iron lids on the stove to cover the holes that, for the burners. And when they mm. went to bed, they would take one of those and wrap it in a towel and take it to bed with them to provide enough heat until they got to sleep. Once they were asleep, it didn't matter whether it got cold or not. They just <laughs> curled up and kept going. But that was one of the tricks of great trick. taking some heat with them to get them to bed. Absolutely. <laughs> and then the poor person who had to go start the fire the next morning, the morning. that yeah. was the coldest part of the day. And, and yes. that was usually mom. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, I think that's or the dad. way things work. So, uh, <laughs> Granddad would probably go out and cut all the wood and bring the wood in and stack it in, but it was probably grandmother that went and started the fire in the morning the to day. get it going. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Well, uh, I think the museum um, at the farm is absolutely exciting from this perspective of seeing all the generations from a mm. hundred plus years in terms of all the buildings are there. The machines mm. are there, the tools are there. You have wonderful exhibits. It's an exciting mm. place to be. And um, I'm so glad that you've made this effort to share with everybody else mm. today as well as in the future. I hope many mm. folks will come and visit you at your museum. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>